Hi there. My name is Liz Smith, and congratulations on signing up for your life and legacy planning session with myself um, through our office. I am recording this video to provide some information to help you prepare. I think I've, I've found uh, through a number of sessions that I've done that in your life and legacy planning session, we go through a lot of information. So my key point, and I'm going to introduce myself some more in just a moment, but I want to make sure that you have the education to make the decisions that are best for your family from the different perspectives involved. And some of the concepts as we go through the initial meeting can be, it's just a lot of information. And so by hearing it a couple of times, it could help. And then just having some background as, as we move into our session, I, I believe will help you. And I look forward to your feedback on whether it does or not. So I appreciate your time that you're taking to watch this video before we meet. I know your time is valuable. So I am going to dive right in and move through this relatively quickly, again, to respect your time, um, but just providing some of the basics. So again, congratulations on scheduling your life and legacy planning session. I really look forward to meeting with you and potentially working together through this process. It is such a gift to your family and then also probably yourself. I love estate planning and some of the benefits include getting financially organized, having a clear picture, and just having a plan in place to make things easier for your family, but also make sure that if you need someone to make decisions for you, healthcare or business decisions, that you're deciding who is going to make those decisions and, and guiding what decisions will be made. All right. So first, I just would love to introduce myself, and then I'll talk about what the state's plan would be for you um, without any planning and use that to then talk about some of the different planning uh, tools. And then I'll talk about how we work so you have an idea going into our meeting. Uh, so first, again, my name is Liz. Um, I, I'm in Juneau, and my now husband and I moved here in 2005 when he attended graduate school. He's a fisheries biologist, and they have a great program in Juneau through the University of Alaska Fairbanks. At that time, was right out of college. I took a couple years and then decided I really wanted to go to graduate school, and I chose law school. I didn't actually think I would practice law, but through school, I went to Vermont Law School thinking I might do environmental law, maybe, but not quite sure. Again, I really wanted that, that structure of education. Um, it was hard when I had graduated college. So off I went, and I discovered early on that I actually thought I was be attracted to being a public defender, representing criminal defendants who can't afford an attorney. And I pursued that right out of law school. I interned with the public defender's office, both uh, law school's three years. So in between years one and two and two and three and was on that path. I didn't get a job right out of law school and um, worked one job and then was a law clerk to Judge Philip Hellenberg in Juneau. And then in 2012, which was the start of state budget cuts, the public defender's office made one hire. I was it, but that was up in Barrow and are now Utgagvik, if I said that correctly. And I, I eagerly took it, uh, left, headed up there, leaving my husband and our, our one dog at the time. We had the lab that you see here in the upper right picture, Murray. And they stayed in Juneau. I went up and I was there for 13 months. It was an incredible start to a legal career uh, while challenging on a personal level uh, with family here in Juneau. I ended up getting our second dog, Sophie, the black terrier, while I was up north to keep me company. And she is quite the terror of a terrier. She's been a handful, but also uh, very, very delightful uh, when she's not barking at people. It's harder to have guests over, but she's a sweetheart uh, most of the time. So I was up there again, great legally, um, but I was happy to take a job at the Juno Public Defender's Office when something opened up after 13 months up north. And that position in Juno was largely representing uh, parents when the state takes custody of their children. So instead of doing the criminal side of things, it's what they call more civil oriented. And I loved that job, uh, but I did 
uh, get burnt out fairly quickly. I was not, um, I was very emotionally attached and I hit, hit some struggles uh, and wanted something different. So I went over to the Department of Law, uh, Civil Division, working with part of Department of Health and Social Services. And in that job, did a lot of fair hearings. I was working with some of the Medicaid programs, which is actually really helpful now in my role. Um, but it was, it was a good job and it was perfect for me at the time. But after a few years, I found something missing in my life. And uh, in 2017, I went to the Institute for Integrative Nutrition to become a health coach. And I loved being a health coach. Um, I had worked with a coach that went to IIN and that led me there. And I really enjoyed working with people individually on their health goals. But I also found that I just loved the creative energy that came with running a business. I had a dream of starting a business. Along my way, I kept thinking, well, if I don't get this job at a certain point in my life, I would start. I had business ideas, but I never carried it out. Working for the state as an attorney in Alaska is a very good, stable job. So I had stuck, stuck with it like I felt I should. But doing this health coaching really made me realize that something was missing. And one of the parts I also loved about it is working with people on an individual level to help them do something they were struggling with. So they might have a goal to eat better or learn to cook healthier foods. And I could facilitate that education for them and work through with them on some of their barriers. I also love the education piece of blogging and again, the business side. So I had that in my toolbox, and then I also realized that as in my role as an attorney, they often would bring the attorney in when there was already a conflict, and I was, I was pretty tired of dealing in the conflict space, which I know is common for attorneys, but not something I was loving. So I thought about leaving. There was a couple of years of my life that was very fraught with, I'm going to leave one day and then, no, I got to stick it out the next. I actually gave notice and then somehow was talked into staying another six months and I gave it my all. I recommitted to that job and thought maybe I can make this work at least until I pay off my law school loans. But it just, it simply didn't happen. And I didn't want to, I wanted to find something I love to do. So I left, uh, took, someone called it a gap year, which is a good way to put it, took a, took a year to figure out what was next. And in that period of time, I, I was working on the health coaching, but it wasn't amounting to too much. And I have this law degree, I thought about what I could do and considered estate planning. Someone, an attorney in town mentioned there might be a need and something about it was appealing to me for a variety of reasons. And I found a wonderful training program called New Law Business Model. And they train attorneys to practice estate planning in a new way. Of course, that's all I know. You'll hear about some of the systems I have in place and through them. And it made me, I've since learned that estate planning can be very um, uh, structured and not necessarily follow up with you. It's easy to work with an attorney and have a plan that's not going to work for you the way that you wanted it to. And that has helped me develop the systems to put in place through Liz Smith Law, always working on new systems and learning new ways to do things. But our goal, I will tell you, is to help you both move through the process, which is challenging, right? I've met with a number of people that start with an attorney and then don't actually finish their plan, but then also to make sure that once your documents are in place, that we're following up with you so that that plan is actually going to work the way that you want. So you'll hear more about that. Um, I just, I love it. Uh, I am recording this in, well, I'll tell you this, I started in the summer of 2019. So to, you can figure out the math depending on when you are watching this. All right. I just quickly, you, I've introduced my dogs, my husband's in the picture here, my hobby, my main hobby is triathlon, and you can see myself on my triathlon bike for my first Ironman triathlon, that was in Australia, which was one of my favorite places. All right, enough about me. Let's cover what um, I will, I, I look forward when I do a webinar, I usually ask about you. 
And in our initial meeting, I will look forward to spending time hearing about yourself and your family. That's really important to me. Uh, but now I want to talk about what would happen, some, some very generalizations about the Alaska law if you don't have any plan in place at all. If you do have a plan in place right now, you have an old will, uh, make sure that I have that before we meet and I will go through with you what would happen under that will, even if you know that it's outdated and you want something different. I think that it's important to start from a place of understanding what would happen now. Um, also, if you have that plan in place, this could still be helpful to you. I encourage you to listen to this piece because it may help with some background and figuring out um, what you would want different or what would happen. All right, so default estate plan is probate. Probate is the court process to pass any assets in your name on to whomever is going to inherit. So if you don't have a plan, plan in place at all, um, someone is gonna have to step forward to be petition the court and start the court process. They're gonna ask to be personal representative or executor. That person's role is to work, they're the face of the court, they're the person with the authority to go to a bank and do what's needed, different, deal with different assets. And their main role is to gather, figure out what there is, what the deceased person had, and then divide up the property. Um, there are a number of guidelines that one must hit with the court system in terms of timelines. Uh, you probably are going to have to publish in the paper for creditors. It is, it's a lot of work for that personal representative, even if they hire an attorney, and they would be the person deciding whether to do that or not. Um, I've experienced that recently where people will just want the attorney to do everything, but you still have a lot to do as personal representative. So you can think about in your family, if you don't have a plan, who would step up and take over that role? There is priority to serve in statute. So if you have a spouse, that person would have what's called the priority, meaning a judge would give more weight to that person to serve. Sometimes there are many adult children and then they all have equal priority. If they can all agree amongst themselves who's gonna serve, that is relatively straightforward and easy, but is there gonna be a conflict? Think about in your own life what might happen. They may have to post a bond, which can make it harder for some uh, people to be able to serve. In Alaska, that process is going to take at least six to 18 months, uh, really 12 to 18 is what I generally say at a minimum. That's if people are following through, but I've seen cases drag out for multiple years. And it is a public process, meaning that anyone can go to the courthouse and find out, get an idea of who's inheriting what uh, and what's going on, what debts the person had. Um, the files are completely open once probate is, is open or completely public once probate is opened. And it can be expensive just going through um, the probate process. So this quote here, uh, demonstrates how some people feel about probate a lot. It's a lawsuit you file against yourself with your own money for the benefit of creditors. One other thing, if you do have minor children, then they cannot inherit the asset. So the court will name someone to uh, hold on to them for the child. They can be used for the child or children, but um, and then when that child turns 18, they'll receive all of the assets without any restriction to do with as they wish. Uh, now in Alaska, there is a process um, that is a little bit easier. Uh, it's quicker, more straightforward than the full probate process, but you just had some tough technical difficulties and lost the recording. So hopefully this will work to pick back up and merge the videos. Uh, so in Alaska, there is a shorter process that m could happen if you meet certain conditions upon your death. And this would be much easier. The court's still involved, but it's quicker and more straightforward for uh, your family to deal with. Um, all three of these conditions must be met. So if you do not own a house or any real proper, other real property, even a small lot, um, so no real property, if the vehicles you own are worth $100,000 or less, uh, 
And then if the rest of your assets are $50,000 or less, and that rest is going to be assets that are actually going through probate, uh, which I'll cover in just a minute, but mainly bank accounts and um, boats would be included in that. Um, so to give you an idea of what we consider your probate estate, so the assets that would actually go through probate, if you don't have a plan, it's going to be the your any real property, of course, so I have fair market value because I just consider the entire property, even if there's a mortgage, um, bank accounts, and then potentially investment accounts, uh, businesses, and then life insurance and retirement, typically, and all these assets, there's potentially ways to, well, there's definitely ways to pass them without going through court. Um, so this is something in your name with no beneficiary listed or no other mechanism set up. Um, life insurance and retirement, you're going to have beneficiaries designated most of the time. Um, definitely something to look at, and we'll look, we'll look at that together at your initial meeting. Um, but anything, any life insurance and retirement that you've listed a minor, because they can't inherit, that's going to get pulled into probate. Uh, so someone will manage those assets. Um, all right. So if you don't want to be stuck with probate, um, a will does not avoid probate. A fully funded living trust does. What about estate taxes? And I'll calculate your estate tax amounts um, in our initial meeting. Um, but just quickly, estate tax is a federal tax, and um, but there's only you only owe a state tax if you're over the exemption amount. So something to do is monitor that, especially if you're a married couple and the survivor could inherit everything. Or is there going to be an estate tax? What I consider a problem? Would you owe any estate tax? Um, we watch that over time based on the value of your assets and whatever the exemption amount amount is. And there's ways to, um, easy ways to potentially avoid it entirely legally or to, to plan for it. Um, all right. So I talked about what the state's plan is. So what are the benefits of a will uh, over the state's plan? And then what is a living trust? A will can keep your family out of conflict, right? So with a will, you're deciding who you want to be personal representative, which even if you have, let's say, adult children and they all get along well, it's nice to have somebody named so that they don't have to figure it out amongst themselves. Things are more straightforward. Uh, and then you're also deciding where your assets are going to go. Uh, something I didn't discuss before is the state's law in terms of where your assets would go is typically a spouse. If you have children from a prior relationship, they may have a right to inherit. And then uh, children, if no, no spouse. And beyond that, if there's no children, it's usually parents. And then if no parents, siblings. Of course, if you have any interest in giving to charity upon your death, that would not happen without a will um, or anything else. If you don't want someone to inherit in your family, you're going to need planning in place, uh, things like that. All right. So with a will, you have control. As I've already discussed, you could also decide how someone is going to inherit if and, and when potentially with a will. Um, it's perfect if you're not going to face probate anyway based on your assets. It can be a good move to start with a will maybe earlier in life, uh, depending on, on your situation. Uh, you could face probate, as I've already said. And then you want a will if you have minor children to consider naming, not to consider, but to name guardians for your children. So if you pass away and there are minor children and no other parent, then the court will decide who would be guardian for your children. And so I, um, you can decide ahead of time who you want to be um, guardians for your, for your children, at least who you would, would ask the court to name. The court's still going to have to name somebody. Um, all right, so what about a living trust? A living trust is an agreement, and it, the very simplified version is that with a trust, the trust owns your asset, so it's not in your name upon death. That means you can avoid court entirely as long as it's what we call fully funded, meaning all the assets are properly titled in the name of your trust. It is, that's the main 
main essence of the trust is to avoid probate, makes things easier, more simple for your family upon your death. It's also cheaper to administer, though it usually costs more to set up now. And yeah, some of the other benefits is the living trust is going to keep your family out of conflict and out of court. Uh, if I think I said, but it can be much more quickly administered. Uh, you have even more control. There's lots of things, especially with a married couple, if they want a joint trust, you can have a lot more control with where assets go and when and how. You can ensure your children do not inherit outright at age 18. You can do that with a will as well. It's a little more straightforward with a living trust tool. Um, you have to set up a trust for your children, but that could be done through a will or, or a trust. Um, but then you could also give assets in trust to your children, which we'll cover at your initial meeting if you have minor children. And then you can limit distributions through a trust. So if you, this is really giving a trust to your beneficiaries, but if they have any, if you're concerned about how they would spend money, um, if you have a child that's uh, been through, had substance abuse issues in the past, and you want someone else to oversee their spending of the money, you can do that in terms of giving with a trust. And lots more to talk about there, but that's a bit um, of an idea. And then you can also provide asset protection by giving in a trust. What does that mean? That if you give assets to somebody, you can keep them out of their estate and uh, avoid any of their creditors. So you can give them in such a way where those assets can be protected if they're involved in some type of lawsuit and judgment against them. All right, so what if you have uh, minor children? I also think about short-term guardians. So what if, uh, and this came from my mentor who had a, a will in place and uh, her husband and her were out for dinner and their two children were at home with a babysitter. And she realized, well, if they were in an accident on their way home, what would happen? The babysitter would probably call the police and they would come and they would probably have no choice but to place the children in the care of a stranger into foster care. You know, there's some chance if the, uh, certainly if grandparents were watching the children, there's, um, but if, if, you don't have family nearby and, and friends um, around that you would want to watch your children. Police aren't going to know who, without proper planning, who you would want to watch your children. So we do temporary guardian nomination so that you're deciding who locally you would want to watch your children in the event of emergency while those longer term guardians uh, uh, get into town. Um, and documents are found, et cetera. All right, couple of other things I just like to throw out there for you to think about long-term care. Uh, if you need nursing home care in the future, how are the financial decisions going to be made? Uh, there are, that's a discussion we can have. Um, there are ways to make sure that some assets still go to your family uh, should you need long-term care. Uh, paid for through Medicaid or something like that. In Alaska, I just heard recently is over 30,000 a month is the average bill for long-term care. And then we also wanna think about incapacity. So if you were unable to make business or, find, or healthcare decisions for yourself, that could be short-term. That could be you're in an accident. So they need to decide if they're gonna do a certain type of surgery and you are unable to participate in that decision. We've seen with COVID when people are on a ventilator, they might not be unable to communicate. And then of course, longer term, um, occurrences such as dementia um, or simply old age and be not wanting to make decisions for yourself anymore. And so there's two things to think about in particular, someone to make business decisions for you, that's a power of attorney, and someone to make healthcare decisions for you. And there's a couple of uh, well, first of all, these documents are really easy to put in place. So we're going to meet for your life and legacy planning session. And if we work together, I will do them for you. There are also some versions available for free that you can do on your own, and we can point you to the direction of those documents. So naming who you want to make decisions right now is really, really easy while you have capacity. If you don't do it and something happens to you and someone has to be named, then that's going to be a guardian 
guardianship or a conservatorship, the court's going to be involved. So what does that mean? That means time. I just had an emergency conservatorship case I was involved with, and we had to wait months, I think a month and a half, at least just to get a court hearing. And that was something urgent. She needed someone appointed to manage her finances so she could keep some state benefits. Um, but the courts are, are full. And then it's also going to probably cost you money if you look to the help of an attorney uh, to help navigate through the process, which I would recommend. Um, and so there's the time, the cost. And then, of course, if you want to decide who's going to make those decisions, if you don't put your wishes in place while you have the capacity to do so, then the judge is going to have to decide. And so who's that going to be in your situation? Um, then so it also if the court appoints someone, so maybe you have this person you would want appointed, um, the court's going to be involved for until you have capacity again. So that means yearly annual reports that your guardian will have to file. And it's just it's more of a hassle. I have some stories on that, but I, I can tell them to you when we meet. Um, all right, so also as we talk about estate planning, I like to make sure that we have our eye on the big picture as well. So of course there's the legal documents to, in terms of how things pass, um, but how, how do you set beneficiaries up for success if they're going to receive a large inheritance? But then also what about your uh, values, insights, and stories, and how do you pass them on? I have lots of resources for you. I love this topic. We also offer for our clients a legacy interview as part of built into the process where you can share some of your stories. If you have minor children, you can talk about what's important in terms of raising them, what's important to you. Um, and otherwise we have, you, you could, we have some good questions about what you've learned in your life that you can pass on to children or grandchildren and maybe walk, watch with them down the road, or if you don't live to, to watch with them uh, so that they can have those memories of you and learn from you. All right. Um, it looks like I had changed the slides, but it's not coming through. So I'm going to pause. All right, I just wanted to cover what it is like uh, to work with us so that you have an idea. Um, you're scheduled for your life and legacy planning session. And so in that meeting, I am not gonna, I'm gonna ask to you to tell me about yourself, right? So if you've already watched this, I won't, that's gonna save us a lot of time, but I'd love to hear about you and your family. And then we're gonna review more specifically what would happen in your situation. So we're gonna look based on your inventory at what assets you have that would go through probate, which assets would not go through probate. We're gonna talk about whether there is a concern that your family is gonna pay a state tax unnecessarily and how we could avoid that. Uh, we're gonna talk about what would happen if you have minor children specific to your family and who is involved. And then I'm going to ask you what is important to you right now. Is there part of your plan that you don't like? Um, it's possible that you're comfortable with the plan as we go through, and that's an option as well. Um, if you don't want a plan that's really comforting uh, just to know what would happen, or if you want something different, then you'll tell me what that is. And then if you'd like, we'll look at the different plans that I offer and what fits best for your family, both from, both from outcome, uh, what your priorities are at this point in time, and what your budget is. And then in that life and legacy planning session scheduled for two hours, we have time to go ahead and design um, your plan, most likely. We could schedule that in another week or two, but usually in that initial meeting, we go ahead and design the plan out uh, fully. You still have a time to review that. So at the end of that uh, life and legacy planning session, we'll schedule a signing date, usually about four weeks out. And between your first and second, the signing meeting, uh, we're going to send you in about a week later, 
two documents. The first is a confirmation of important and missing information or the CME that outlines all the decisions made in your design. So you have an opportunity to review, make sure that's what you wanted. You can speak with me if you have questions or wanna change things at that point. And then we'll, if we need an address or some other information, we just highlight that in yellow in the document and you can use track changes to give us that information or just enter it and make sure it's highlighted. And then I also ask you to review, make sure the names are spelled correctly and that the dates are correct. We also prepare a family wealth inventory for all of our clients. That's to make sure that people, <coughs> when you're gone, know what you had and that it's not, um, a painful process to wait for statements, to try and find things online, and to have assets potentially lost. So we want a clear idea of what you have. We also use that inventory, we use a spreadsheet in Excel, and we use that to communicate with you so that we're getting, first we wanna look at all the statements and make sure that we're clear about who the owners are and uh, beneficiaries listed, things, of that nature. And then we use that to communicate with you in terms of any benefits to make the plan work as simply as possible for your family. If you decide that you want a living trust, then we're going to communicate um, if you're transferring assets, how to do that. We'll talk more about that piece. Um, so then a signing meeting, we'll go through your plan, answer questions, and you sign. That takes usually about an hour. And then we hold on to documents so that we can scan them. And then we send um, meet again and go through, you get the documents at that point. We have them on a USB for you as well to make things easier for you. And we'll talk about your next steps from there. Uh, we offer that priceless conversation in between meetings two and three typically. And then we offer a free review at least every three years. And that is to make sure that that plan is staying up to date with your life. So in that free review, we're going through your plan, talking about any changes in your family and talking about any changes in the law. Uh, we also have a VIP membership program for our clients who are interested in some more ongoing support. Uh, so for our VIP memberships, we're gonna offer that review every year. And we have a lot of other perks as well, such as uh, discounts on planning for family members, um, putting some of those key foundational documents in place for children, young adult children, and some other, uh, other perks. All right, so that is the end of this presentation. And thank you so much for taking the time to watch this before our life and legacy planning session. Again, I very much meet, look forward to meeting you and learning about your family. I just love, I love the work I do and I can't wait to meet you. And I am offering, uh, if because you watched this, um, if you use the code I made it, just let me know that you made it through the video in our meeting, and I'm happy to offer you $100 off if you decide that you want to go forward and plan with us. So again, let me know I made it uh, at our meeting, and I will make sure to give you that $100 off. All right, that also will just let me know who actually made it through so that I know whether, let me know that right up front um, so that I can gear our conversation. It'll make things a lot more efficient in the initial meeting and I'll save your time that way. All right, I look forward to meeting with you, bye.